Thank you for attending today's webinar, Improved Genome Editing Using Single-Stranded DNA, presented by Dr. Ye Chen. Dr. Chen serves as Associate Director of Research and Development for GeneWiz and has been involved in various projects involving NGS and gene editing services. Dr. Chen received his PhD from Max Planck Institute in Germany, where his research was focused on neuroscience. He also worked as a postdoctoral researcher in biophysics and immunology at Swinburne University in Australia. Without further ado, here is Dr. Ye Chen. Thank you for the kind introduction. I would like to uh, introduce a nice trick in genetic experiments that is using long single-strand DNA as donor for knocking experiment. So in this presentation, I will go through in which scenario single-strand DNA could be helpful and its advantages to other approaches. Then I will compare different methods for its preparation before reaching to the conclusion of this talk. For the interest of this audience, we need to make a couple of decisions before we execute a genetic, uh, genetic experiment. First, uh, it's reverse versus forward genetics. If you are after a clear phenotype, then go for forward genetics, such as a random mutagenesis screening using SGRN library. Then identify the genetic element underlying the phenotype. On the other hand, if you don't have a clear phenotype, but have a clear genetic element to target, normally from previous studies or bioinformatic work, then you go for reverse genetics, which is the focus of our topic today. For that, you also have to make two choices. Do I make randomly or precisely insertion of this element into the genome? Random insertion is easy to achieve, but comes with the risk of multiple copy insertions or disrupting uh, the endogenous functional element where your uh, element is inserted into the genome. In addition, the insertion uh, element may be subject to various level of local genetic regulations. So a more reproducible, uh, reproducible way to do is a precise gene editing. We can delete or insert a genetic segment at exactly the location we want. Point mutation or replacement can also be considered as a special type of insertion or knocking, which will be our focus today. Once we decided that we want to do knocking experiment, there are some further technical points to decide on. First, should we generate a double strand break at the location we want? To break it or not, Two homo homology arms are always designed that perfectly matches the sequence of the genome we want to insert. The exogenous sequence is flanked between the two homology arms, as you can see the red bars here. Later on, we will give examples that a break normally greatly improves the in, uh, efficiency of the insertion. The next decision to make is how to precise generate a break on the targeted region. Some proteins, such as talon or thin finger, uh, has programmable protein modules that recognize a given sequence. However, the relationship between protein modules and nucleotide is not as straightforward, which limits the application. Another simpler, hence more popular, choice is the well-known CRISPR system. Uh, which utilize RNA and protein complex to achieve sequence selectivity. As RNA and DNA pairing is one-on-one, -on -one, this method becomes a choice of the people quickly. Once we decided on CRISPR system to generate a precise double strand break, we still need to decide how we deliver those components and what form of template for repairing. As you can see in this table, there are several ways to manipulate your target region, from no DNA break, single nick to double DNA, uh, double strand break, as you can see here. Okay, and you can use either no template, single strand RNA, single strand DNA, and double strand DNA as a repairing template. It's worthwhile to carefully consider and explore all these possibilities because different combinations triggers different cellular pathway for repair, and different cellular pathway 
uh, for repairing, we determine how efficient the knocking is. In the next few slides, we will focus on comparing double-strand DNA versus single-strand DNA in the presence of a double-strand break. In the context of a double-strand break generated by CRISPR, followed by a repairing template, uh, which can be either single-strand DNA or double-strand DNA. Single-strand DNA outperforms double-strand DNA in several scenarios, including um, human uh, peripheral blood cell or mice. The knocking efficiency is in general higher for various lengths of insert. In addition, it's less toxic and, uh, to the host and should higher species uh, specificities. In the next few slides, I will use some specific examples to highlight the unique advantage of single-strand DNA in knocking experiment. Before going into special details, I would like to emphasize that using SSDNA as a knocking template is nothing but a new trick. It's intuitive to come up with this idea, actually, a single-strand DNA contains as much genetic information as double-strand DNA. Therefore, in the 80s, before we can freely generate targeted double-strand break in uh, eukaryotic cells, there are several initiatives to test single-strand DNA as double-strand DNA in terms of knocking efficiency, and the results show promising. Um, with the development of Zinfinger, Talon, and CRISPR. Uh, Single-strand DNA has been used in many organisms, from uh, algae, C. elegans, to mouse, uh, non, even non-human primate. Knocking or conditioned knockout mouse is a typical example how single-strand DNA combined with CRISPR has changed the way people generate mouse models. Previously, the knocking is achieved by homologous recombination without double strand break in a stem cell, which is then injected into the uh, developing embryo in the blastoma stage. Only some of those cells were developed into uh, uh, the germline cells, which will uh, grow up to the next generation. And you can only find out whether you get your uh, targeted insert in the, uh, after a year in F1 generation. As an alternative, CRISPR complex and single-strand DNA can be injected into a fertilized egg directly. If the genetic editing took place, all the cells developed from this embryo will contain the genetic editing event you hope for. This process is therefore shortened to less than six months, and no in vitro screening of stem cells is further required. I will then use condition knockout as an example of how long single-strand DNA make life of research easier. As we all know, to construct a conditional knockout cell line, two short lot space site has first to be introduced, uh, insert into the axon of your interest, flanking the axon of your interest. So although it's a knockout experiment, a knocking is required in the first place. Therefore, there are intuitively at least two ways to reach this end, which is to insert to log space site into the genome. Both ways, you start with two sgRNA to generate two cuts precisely at the log space size you want to introduce. Then uh, you can use either two short repairing templates, can be either double or single chain DNA, or you can use a long donor, again, double or single strain DNA as a repairing template. Both methods actually have been tested and different efficiency values have been reported by researchers around the world. And we just list some of the key publications uh, for your further reference. The efficiency actually can be close to 50% for relatively long insert in some reports, which is the reason why we consider long single DNA is a nice choice in this scenario. We come to a second example using single-strand DNA to knock in, in primary human peripheral T cells. The efficiency by single-strand DNA is similar or even higher than using double-strand DNA. 
More importantly, once we have such high efficiency of knocking, we start to consider or value other aspects of this experiment, such as how toxic your repairing template to your host cell is, and the off-target rate. You can see that single-stream DNA is less toxic to the cell, so it can tolerate more template. More importantly, the off-target rate or the specificity is much higher than double-stream DNA. You can see from this graph, even without Cas9 or a guide RNA, double-strand DNA have a 0.1% rate of randomly incorporated into the genome, which is a well-known phenomenon. When there is Cas9 protein, but the sgRNA target a totally different region where single-strand DNA uh, sequence is, the off-target incorporation rate for the double-strand DNA dramatically increases, while the single-strand DNA remains the same. To sum up, when the efficiency is satisfactory for either strategies, other factors should also be taken into account during, during considerations. Okay, I hope you start to think like single-strand DNA is a nice tool for your locking experiment. So you want to start designing your single-strand DNA. Actually, you still consider several techno technically parameters for your SSDNA design. For example, uh, this paper shows that the efficiency of knocking is higher when single-strand DNA sequence is designed to be the same strand as what single-strand where the sgRNA targets. And the SSDNA sequence should be skewed to the upstream of the cut generated by the single-strand DNA so that the knocking efficiency is higher. This example shows some further tips for how you design single-strand DNA. As we said, in general, the homology arm of single-strand DNA can be shorter than when you're using a homologous recombination strategies. But still, the optimum lens, you have to steer up to your verification and optimization. For example, in HEC-293 cell lines, when you knock in different lens of insert, the optimum homology arms is different. Okay, in general, the longer, the knock, uh, knocking sequence is, the longer the homology arm should be. And when you compare figure A and figure C, you will see that when you knocking the same insert and also to the same protein of your target, but different cell lines, the optimal uh, homology arms uh, is different from each other. So it has to be decided by a case-by-case -case scenario. This slide further shows you more reference for the design of single-strand DNA. Again, uh, I would say reported values can at best save as the starting point of your optimization. It heavily depends on the genomic region you want to target and the biological system you start work on. So let's come to the last part of our presentation. Up to now, I hope I've, I have convinced you that single-strand DNA has its unique advantages in some knocking experiment at least. So your immediate question is how can we prepare it? There are three major rules for preparation, chemical rules, PCR-based, and NICAS rules. For all chemical synthesis, it's essentially oligo you order for your uh, everyday experiment. However, uh, it only can be applied to short sequence such as less than 200 nucleotide. The advantage of this approach is that it's really cheap and fast. But as the length increase, the chance of missing one or even more nucleotide become larger, which start to become intolerant for experiment. These limit the maximum acceptable length, so they're actually not suitable to do for synthesize of long single-strand DNA. So, uh, in the next two slides, I will focus on four variants of PCR-based methods. The first two are reverse transcription and exonuclear methods. For reverse transcription, you first prepare a double-strand template. Uh, only one of the strands will be transcribed into an RNA, which is then reverse transcribed into a single-strand DNA. Then, both the double strand DNA and the RNA can be removed from the reaction system, and the single strand DNA of your target is remained. Similarly, for exonuclear uh, method, we start with a double strand DNA template, 
and we do a PCR, but only one type of primer is phosphorylated. And after the PCR reaction, you have increased amount of dustrin DNA, but only one strand has its five prime and phosphorylated. As we know, the exonucleus, a special type of exonucleus, only recognize such uh, phosphorylated five prime end, and it will preferentially digest the strain, the red strain here. So in theory, uh, only the black strain is remain after the exonuclear treatment, which again is uh, the SFDNA you want. The other two PCR-based methods are similar in this aspect. For example, uh, we can, instead of labeling one primer with a uh, phosphorylated end, we can label one primer with Affinitec during PCR. Okay, so then we can pull down this later on by magnetic beds, uh, bits. The affinity tag can be in standard like uh, strap editing biotin pairs. After the pull down experiment, there's only one strain remained in reaction buffer, which is the SADN you want. Asymmetric PCR is very standard and I don't need to spend too much time on it. When you do the PCR, you just add asymmetric ratio of two types of primers. Of course, the single strain DNA strain you go after, should, uh, the primer should be add in excess. So uh, we have covered the four types of uh, PCR-based method to generate single strain DNA. In general, all PCR-based methods are cheap and quick. But as you know, PCR is tricky. For each sequence of your target, you have to optimize for PCR reaction conditions and to achieve the best efficiency. And there are some sequences which is not so compatible with PCR reaction. And this will limit the speed and also in terms of a company, the batch production of different sequences from different customers. Uh, another concern is that additional errors may be introduced by polymers, especially the reverse transcriptors, which is error prone. But I think the major concern is how you remove the template double strand DNA. If it's not removed completely, the result may be inter uh, interpreted differently. For example, does the knocking you observe in your experiment actually the knocking by the double strand donor or single strand donor? Okay, uh, the exonucleus type of experiment have an additional concern that the nucleus actually doesn't distinguish perfectly between the two strands. So you will always have a partially digested single strand DNA you want in your final product. So the residue level of either double strand DNA template or the other single strand is always a concern in PCR-based methods. Finally, the biotin strap everything based approaches is more costly because of the beads and the affinity tag. So uh, we will come to the last method of generating single strand DNA, which is the approach Jimmy's choose. So it's a PCR-free method. It depends on a sp specific restriction enzyme called NICUS to generate a single strand break. The end sequence that you want, the one in green, is first cloned into a special vector. It's flanked by the NICUS recognized sequence, which is in red here, okay? And the NICUS uh, recognized sequence should be at least on one end of the sequence you want, so the red box. The other end can be either a NICUS recognized sequence, which will result in a single strand break, or it can be a normal uh, restriction site, which will uh, become a double strand break. In any case, after the NICUS treatment, you will get your single strand DA, and the rest of the construct will run to different position, okay, into uh, in a job, and then you can job purify your product. As I said, this method is the way gene we choose to produce our single strand DNA, and for several reasons, okay. First, all the single strand DNA is colony de derived, okay. It starts with a single colony. We actually verify the sequence by saying it twice. You can see before the nickel digestion and after the nickel digestion. So after we purify from the gel. Uh, purification from the electrophoresis also minimizes the endotoxin, 
And in principle, it shouldn't contain anything else, no double strand DNA, no complementing single strand DNA. And by this method, we can generate up to 10,000 nucleotide long of long single strand DNA, calling it derived all sequence very very fine. And as you know, a plasmid is more tolerant to PCR incompatible sequence, which makes the manufacturing easier. So as I said, that in general, several concerns uh, when you want to produce your own single strand DNA endotoxin, especially when you want to do microinjection or use it uh, in cell culture. Single sequencing is still the golden standard for sequence uh, validation and any potential double strand DNA, reverse strand RNA, depending on what method you need, uh, incomplete digestion single strand DNA should also be minimized and should be very validated. Okay, so I just put a summarizing uh, slide here comparing the key performance of all these six methods when you plan to generate your single strand DNA. Again, we believe in terms of quality, nicking enzyme based method is the choice. But if you have other concerns, so if you care more about costing or timing, you may choose other methods at UV. So finally, we reach our conclusion slide. We hope during this talk, you are more familiar and convinced with SSDNA's great potential in assisting your knocking experiment. And whenever you design an experiment with double strand DNA, think about using single strand DNA as an alternative. We have also carefully compared the methods for producing single strand DNA, and we, Jinwiz, choose sneakers methods as we value our product quality the most. So that will be the end of this presentation, and I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you for your presentation. That was very insightful information. We're going to move to the Q&A now. We had some questions come in. First question, does the purity of SSDNA affect the knock-in efficiency? If so, how? Uh, the short answer is yes, in two aspects. In terms of sequence purity, depending on how your SSDNA is synthesized, there may be some SSDNA with incomplete sequence. So this may result in a seemingly partial knocking. Residue double strand DNA or antisense single strand DNA is also knocking, but with different efficiency. So this may complicate your efficiency analysis as a, uh, you're looking at a mixed effect. Uh, the second aspect is chemical purity. Any unwanted chemicals such as endotoxin will increase your cell mortality rate which is in a lower efficiency of knocking. What method does GeneWiz use for purification of SSDNA? Well, as I have introduced in the webinar, we use a nucleus-based method. So in the final step, after the nucleus digestion, we run the whole product by electrophoresis, and we cut the gel band out and purify it with silica membrane-based purification. In this sense, we can make sure that the size is correct and there is no residue double strand DNA left after you recover the single strand DNA from the gel. In addition, this process will remove the residue chemicals effectively. Actually, our custom feedback is great in terms of this aspect of cell viability. Are there any sequence requirements for SSDNA synthesized by GeneWiz? Well, almost no special requirement. Again, back to how we synthesize our SSDNA, the first step is a standard gene synthesis process. So the basic rules for gene synthesis applies. For example, there are some indicators in your sequence which may cause a lengthy gene synthesis project or even a failed one, such as if your sequence contains too much repetitive sequence or the GC content is at extreme value too high or too low. Uh, nevertheless, in general, it's not a problem as GeneWiz is excellent in delivering such difficult sequence. The second possibility, which is much less likely to happen, is the nicus sequence compatibility. So there are only a few nicus to choose. And in a very rare case, if your sequence happen to contain all the restriction size for all the available nicus, we may ask you to modify your sequence. Otherwise, our nickels will cut below your sequence, right? In this case, if you can't modify your sequence, 
we may synthesize your SSDNA using an alternative method. Of course, we, we communicate with you before that. Is there any relationship between SSDNA length and knock-in efficiency? Okay, this question start to move to the user's end. So the short answer is yes. The answer is definitely context dependent, right? Depending on what system you're using for uh, knock-in. There is, based on uh, published uh, literature, there's a general trend of decreasing efficiency with increasing knock-in length. This applies to single string DNA as well. There was a slide in this webinar where you can look up for the actual numbers. I would like to emphasize that for 2KB or even longer knock-in, the efficiency of single string DNA can still be quite high. So it would be less a concern when you are choosing single string DNA. Last question. What method would you recommend for the delivery of SSDNA into mammalian cells? Again, uh, I think many of our customers or the listeners are in a better position to answer this question as they are actually the end user of single string DNA. Based on published information, what I can say is that single string DNA can be effectively delivered by microinjection, uh, electroporation, or a liposome based method. Looks like in the interest of time, we'll have to stop here today. Once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Chen for his presentation and all the attendees for joining us. If you'd like to watch this presentation again or any of the other webinars that are part of Webinar Week, the recordings will be available at genewis.com webinar week.